Hi, my name is Eric, and in this series I'm challenging myself to create an original sci-fi world with its own robots, creatures, map, lore, and even language. Today I'll be building this droid vendor. I'll take you along the process while shedding some more light on this strange world of Aegis. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. Today we're traveling from the arid regions of Ankara to the canyons of Hengamaru, where a popular marketplace teams with travelers, nomadic droids, and bartering tribes. Instead of a human vendor though, I wanted to make another droid, and I found there's really no better place to start when it comes to droids than old Gundam models for a base. Once it was all broken apart to get a closer look at the skeleton, I started modifying. This chess piece was the first victim of my creative vandalism, primarily because it was too Gundam-y and needed to be a little more beyond the blighty. If you're joining me for the first time, the title of this series comes from mysterious fungal blight that overtook this planet some decades ago, driving the majority of the human population underground and giving rise to these cobbled together surface dwelling droids. As tough and cool as Gundam body designs look, the proportions always make me think of Sailor Moon meets Optimus Prime meets this shrunken headed dude from Men in Black. So I added some length to the waist with this acrylic tube to make the proportions a bit more humanoid. Sometimes attaching oddly shaped pieces to one another can be challenging because there aren't many points of contact. To solve that issue here for this waist part, I'm jamming in a bunch of air dry clay for a snug fit. A similar technique was used here to fill in these unnatural gaps, this time with milliput. As with the last video, all of these materials I'm using are linked to in the video description in case you want to try this out for yourself. Now, as cool as these Gundam legs were, I wanted to go with something entirely different for my droid. And this Dollar Store Final Faction toy set, although made from terribly cheap and mushy plastic, contributed exactly what I was looking for, an exoskeleton. After some slight modifications and a flat black paint job, I twisted up lengths of electrical wire together for the cybernetic leg sinews. Then I attached them to the thigh joints. I painted those up too, then grimed up the wires just a bit with a watered down brown acrylic paint, and then attached the exoskeleton to the thighs and sealed everything up for a snug enclosure. I next attached the base of the leg wires to the soles of the feet with a bit more milliput. I used these uh, shoulder armor pieces, I think, for the backs of the droid's hands, then sculpted milliput for the fingers. The droid vendor that is the focus of this build today hawks his wares at a marketplace popular with the middlings. In previous videos I've mentioned the unders, the people that live below the surface of this planet, and the overs, the people who live above, but a third much smaller group known as the middlings are comprised of nomadic human tribes that live between the worlds of the overs and the unders and often serve as the commercial link between the two peoples. Marketplaces like this are a melting pot however, as members of both the overs and unders are forced to do business here if they want food or supplies from other regions. While walking past the vendor stalls, two common Ajizian phrases you might hear are Sembagune, for too expensive, or Hakkavila, which means how much does this cost? For the arms, I used my usual method of limb elongation via Q-tip rods, then added robo-biceps with these plastic beads. Next came some wires and cables for the holes I drilled previously into the torso, and then the hand was added to one arm, while a mechanical claw replaced the other. There's an important reason for this that ties into the droid's history and that we'll get to in a bit. Finally, a bit more bulk was added thanks to these electrical plug safety caps, and then a bit of styrene was hole punched and glued into place for some residual armor. The boots then got a coat of leather brown, and after the body was primed in a flat black, I went over the pieces individually with a brush and some Vallejo acrylic paints. I went with the cream color for most of the parts, with some color accents in orange. The droid sports an aftermarket paint job, with the original colors being mostly grays and black. Some finer detailing was done in metallic paints, and a bit of paint chipping was achieved by lightly scraping off the top layer with a metal blade. 
Within the chipped areas, I then added a tiny bit more silver paint to simulate gouged metal. I next crafted a raggedy cloak for the droid out of this dyed paper towel. When it was still damp, I cut it to shape, then coated it in some Mod Podge to help lock it in this wavy fabric shape. While that dried, I also gave the droid a bit of a grimy wash to weather it, along with drilling in some holes to keep it in place atop the terrain. One of the final details was this UV resin, and though you can't really see it too well in the final build, I thought it looked a lot like a glass lens. I then added the dried, stiffened cape along with a bunch of little leather pouches and money bags that I'd sculpted off camera. I went back and forth a lot on whether or not to add this hat, but in the end I decided that it added a lot of character to the droid, giving him an almost snake oil salesman vibe, which I think is perfect for his backstory. With the droid painted and assembled, it was time to move on to his creature companion. The alien beast of burden in question is known as a Makjena, or literally a shy beast. These sturdy tortoise-like reptiles are common work animals among the middlings, often used to pull carts and haul supplies through the rocky canyons, which serve as their natural habitat. With my shy beast sketched out, I built a quick and dirty wire frame, covered it up in aluminum foil, then covered that in a base layer of clay. Then came a quick bake in the oven to harden it, and next was the outer clay layer, which is where I'll sculpt the details. Using this plastic straw, a ballpoint pen tube, and a Q-tip rod, I carved out the scales by gently inserting half of the tube tip into the clay, then pulling out and away ever so slightly. Small cones of polymer clay made up the mock Jenna's toes, after which tinier details were carved into place. Finer textures like these imperfections on the scales and folds in the thick skin were added last. For the head, another piece of wire wrapped in foil was hot glued in place atop the body, but something to definitely keep in mind here is that if you attempt this during the baking process, the glue will absolutely melt, so it's crucial to use as little as possible and secure the clay in place using other methods once the hot glue dries. Once the head was covered in polymer clay, I began adding skin folds and grooves using fine clay strings. And after the eye stalks were added using translucent clay, I finished texturing the neck, then added the mouth. For the shell, which was the trickiest bit of this creature build, I built some wire into the rough shape of the rim, covered it in foil, then added the curved dome, also with aluminum. Then came the outer clay layer, and once that was all smoothed out, I imprinted the hexagonal pattern with this ball stylus. Some turtle shells also feature pointed protrusions, like this alligator snapping turtle, this African spurred tortoise, and a bowser, so to add that feature I pressed on little mounds of clay and then blended them into place. After that, I added some grooves using a silicon tip tool, then I detailed the shell rim. Now, I did have to make some last minute leg adjustments here because they were way too big for the tiny shell, and in fact, even the end result isn't super realistic, but then again, we're making a snail turtle thing on a planet full of robots, so I like to think I have a little creative license when it comes to alien anatomy. With the mock Jenna primed in a tan color, I gradually darken the color with a series of brown and black washes. And once that was completed, along with some light dry brushing to bring out some of the dusty highlights, I added the pupils to the eye stalks and got working on the next part. Now, since the droid in this build is a vendor, he needed wares which I sculpted off-camera with various colors of polymer clay. The colors were pretty flat and uninteresting though, so to add some variation I added washes and non-diluted paints. The wares here are primarily foods and seasonings, like these spicy mushroom caps from the swamps of Chikara. Next came the wooden display shelves for the Mokjena's protective carapace. 
I made these out of one inch popsicle sticks using my signature method of roughly eyeballing it, making some arbitrary pencil marks, then coating my workspace and fingers in super glue. The result was okay, but they looked a lot more like bookshelves than market displays, and since I thought a mushroom vendor would be a lot cooler than a Torterra with a Barnes and Noble on its back, I redid everything with copy stirs. Once that was all painted, stained, and dusted with pastels, I got to working on the leather harness that holds the shelves in place. I'm using air dry clay here, just gently rolling out some long worms of the stuff before flattening them into place on the shelf. A ball stylus made for a nice stitch texture, and once the air dry clay had dried about a day later, I painted it up. To give the shell the look of a smooth, worn surface, I added a light coat of glossy Mod Podge, then pressed the shelves into place atop a bit of Milliput. For the base, I'm using yet another cheap decorative frame inset with XPS insulation foam. My go-to place for frames is my local Hobby Lobby. They often have huge discounts, and this one here was only a couple of dollars. To give the XPS foam a rocky look, I first carved jagged shapes out of the edges with a razor knife, then textured the top with some aluminum foil. Some tree bark that I liberated from my local nature trail was then added as rocks. I held it down with modeling paste, which hid the gaps and could be easily watered down and sculpted further. I also added some tiny rocks, which is actually just non-clumping kitty litter, and then some sand. And all this stuff was held down with watered down white glue. Once it had all dried a day or so later, I painted everything in this gray earthy color, then changed my mind completely for a more unearthly, almost Martian look. Then came just a bunch of washes and browns and pastel dust. My methodology for terrain, regardless of the style, is to just layer tons of related colors. This gives it a rich, varied look. Last came a khaki dry brushing to highlight all of the edges. The droid was then inserted into the base, after which I added some clumps of dead grass. I also lined the wooden display crates with dyed paper towels, since the dividers were so shoddily made that they allowed for foods to sneak under them and fraternize. Then, for the base, instead of wood, I used wood. And then came my favorite part of this build, adding all the mushrooms, fruits, and spices. And of course, the shop sign, which reads, Andena. And that was that. This droid belongs to an old class of decommissioned military bots known as the Iron Claw. Built as a private army for the royal families who originally populated this region, they were feared for their speed and strength. But as the blight spread inexorably over the surface of the planet, even affecting the drier northern regions, many of the royal families migrated off-world, abandoning their robotic militia. When the droids ran out of power, they were salvaged and reprogrammed for hard labor and menial tasks. While there is little proof these days that these droids pose any kind of threat to anyone, old-timers still recall their previous ruthless nature and tend to avoid interacting with them. 
This makes them especially useful in commerce, however, as few would think to steal money from what was once part of a dangerous royal military. Well guys, this was a fun one, made possible in part thanks to my lovely patrons here. If you want to hear more stories from Beyond the Blight, check out this playlist, and until next time, this is Gamey Bills, over and out.